is this? I mean, hello? Welcome to Pop Prime TV's The Outlier. I'm your host, Lauren Conlin, and I've got a pretty fun episode for you today, Crime Scenes Gone Wrong. And I'll be joined by former homicide detective turned private investigator, Don Tabak. Don has worked more than 24 years with the LAPD and has a perfect track record as a homicide detective. Don is also the host of the live show in Los Angeles or the Santa Monica area to be exact, which is called Crime Scene Live at the Illusion Magic Lounge, where Don takes the audience on an interactive journey in helping solve a cold case. And there's actually a, a a show this coming weekend. So I feel like this is a, a thing now. I mean, I would spend every weekend there if that was me and I lived there and I could actually help solve a cold case or, or hone my skills. Uh, but I thought it would be fun to grab Dawn and talk about crime scenes and talk about three cases in particular where I feel like law enforcement really dropped the ball. And these are very high profile cases. But as a disclaimer, I want to add that in no way am I disrespecting police with this episode. I am a huge fan of the police. Uh, I, I really do support them, but I think it's important to hear about some of these cases where police are human beings. They're, they're not robots and balls were dropped. Uh, so let me just shut up for a minute and I will bring in my guest, Don Tabak. Hey, Don. Hey, Lauren. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm living the dream, so it doesn't get any better than this, does it? Great. And the weather is much nicer for you in LA than it is in New York City, I take it. Yeah, but it's time for us to get cold again. So it starts feeling like Thanksgiving. So you got it on that part. Okay, that's that's fair. That's fair. Well, I wanna I wanna start off by talking about a really high profile case, the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Simpson. I'm sorry, Ron Ron Goldman. Excuse me. Um, would have been Ron Simpson. Yeah, gosh, no. And Nicole Nicole Simpson and uh, Ron Goldman. I mean, this crime scene, this murder scene, it was critical. Now, in your opinion, what specific missteps were made by the handling of this case by the LAPD? What did they do when they, you know, when they saw Nicole and they saw Ron, they saw the blood, they saw what, what happened from there? Well, well, keep in mind that by the time that law enforcement arrived, the, the crime was probably three hours old. And they were brought into it, LAPD was, because Nicole, or, uh, uh, Nicole's dog and Akito, white Akito, was wandering the streets around 1.32 o'clock in the morning and had blood on it. And a neighbor mm -hmm. saw the dog and takes the dog back to Nicole's place and uh, opens the gate and sees these two people there in a pile of blood streaming down the sidewalk. They call law enforcement. Law enforcement responds. It's very, very darkly lit, Nicole. Nicole, um, Laura. So when law enforcement gets there, they don't know what they have. They're obviously going to trample the crime scene because they don't know what, what kind of a crime scene it is. Right. So bloody footprints, shoe prints from law enforcement is going to be all over the place. There's going to be other hand print or fingerprints. And they just don't have a handle on it yet. Remember, there's only two law enforcement guys that roll up there in a patrol car. And they're trying to assess what they have and what they're going to need. Law enforcement, the two officers that arrive originally, don't know it's Nicole Simpson. They, they don't know her, but they know that they have two people down, obviously murdered, and now they're making their notifications to West LA homicide, because each division in LAPD at the time had a homicide unit. Mm -hmm. So they're called, they get to the scene, and they do realize that it's Nicole and another a male, and they now start conducting the murder scene. And because Nicole Simpson was married to OJ, <clears throat> now it's becoming a very important case and our robbery homicide division is called in. Mm. And 
they're it's not that they're better than the, than the divisional detectives, but they have the time to work these sensational cases. West LA detectives are probably running with five, six, eight cases of murders each, and back in the day, and RHD doesn't have a lot of cases, so they're going to respond to the scene. And now they have probably six homicide guys. There's a slew of patrol guys, and the crime scene now is secured, and now the investigation has started. So, and Don, this is after people were kind of walking through all the blood and, and just sort of. Correct. Law enforcement oh. had already been the, the patrol guys were there. They didn't know, you know, what's on the ground. So they're they're right. stepping it. And you try to be as careful as you can. But every scene, Laura, uh, across the world mm. is going to be somewhat contaminated. I worked an arson uh, bombing homicide unit. I started that unit. And to go in there in an arson fire, that's a murder which you read about. Well, the fire department comes in there and puts out the fire. Well, that water at 8 billion pounds per square inch washes everything away. So you really have no crime scene left. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. th this happens and you try to make the best of it and you try to make any, you know, um, correct any mistakes that are made at the scene. And hindsight's twenty twenty. I mean, those guys did a great job as far as what was there. And what happened afterwards was really not an issue of did Van Adder and Lang violate OJ's constitutional rights by going over the, the fence to see the, uh, the Bronco, which we'll get into in a minute. But it was really became through that great defense team that they had a trial of LAPD because they yeah. attacked everything that we did. Right, right. But what do you what do you say about uh, like the blood samples in the case, for example? I feel like the the chain of custody was so off there. They, they were mishandled and some of the samples were left unrefrigerated. How do you how do you explain that? And so, what are the consequences for this besides someone getting off for murder, allegedly? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Um, back then. There were two places that we could book blood samples down in our, our central facility in los angeles or in the van nuys facility in the san fernando valley of, of the city of l.a when you're running with a murder and it's going now you're on your 30 40th hour and you have blood stuff the last thing you're going to do is go back if you're 80 you know the city of los angeles is a large yeah. city and if you're at one end and you have to go back to the other end and it's time that we just go get some sleep and we'll meet back here in a couple hours, you take the blood with you. And I'm here to tell you, Laura, I've done that so many times in so yeah. many scenes. I put it in the refrigerator. Um, I would, and again, we didn't know any better. I would put bloody clothing in a bag mm -hmm. and keep it at the house or keep it in the car. And then when I got closer to the place to book it, I would book it then. So the inference, and you got to give credit to their, to his, that, that $4 million or $5 million trial team he had is, the entrance is, well, you had the opportunity to splatter the blood. And now all we have to do is convince those wonderful 12 jurors that you did that. And we've won our case. But we could have done things different, but it wasn't set up that way. Today, we have such a great um, opportunity to book our blood, to book our bloody clothing, to get SID out on it, our scientific investigation division. But back then, and it wasn't, you know, we're not talking about 1731. This is, you know, just back in, in 94. Right. But the good thing about it and across the board with law enforcement is you really do learn from your mistakes. And you try, like I said, you try to minimize them, but you're going to contaminate a scene somehow in every scene. That one, they exposed it and looked like we were just absolutely stupid. And, and, and they probably were right. No, so, and just to be clear, you were on, um, you were working as a homicide detective during this, this, um, this murder case or this double murder case of Nicole and Ron, but you did not work on this case specifically? Correct. Uh, okay. I did not have just... anything to do with the case. My, my okay. former partners and, and, and coworkers were all involved in that case. And I was talking to them daily about what was going on. And, uh, and then, yeah. And then, you know, Obviously, since then, I, I've read everything that I've been able to read about that case and be able to speak on it with some sort of, not expertise, but some sort of knowledge. So let me ask you, did you, did you know Mark Furman? Yes, I, I know him casually from, you know, seeing him around the city of L.A. And uh, 
you know, I, I, I listen, there, there are, there are really, really sharp people. And then there are not so sharp people. And then there's kind of drone people. And Mark yeah. said in that, you know, Mark thought he was more than he was. And I, and I said this before, um, probably not the brightest star in the sky that was out there handling that murder. He worked West LA homicide, which was not a very busy homicide unit back in the day as Hollywood was, or any of the South central divisions were. So, you know, Mark, Mark was Mark. Mark was a brash guy, you know, and yeah, body. and allegedly racist as well. Um, and he, he seemed to have these personal bias and, and, and conflicts here, which just did not uh, go well on the stand at all. No, and he, you know what, you're you're taught to, and and I, I was embarrassed for the guy because he let Epley Bailey, who really was a, of a braggart attorney, and he, of course, he's deceased now. He can't defend himself, but he wasn't well thought of mm -hmm. by law enforcement, obviously. And I know a couple of people who he represented criminally who were absolutely, you know horrified by the guy mm. so Furman was able to he was able to get under Furman's skin horribly yeah and then Mark again not being wide enough to understand what he's doing just fell into Bailey and that was critical you know he starts talking about Peggy York the captain that he worked for and she isn't it was an a-hole mm. to work for that was Lancito's wife yeah, you know, yeah. He's getting it. but you know and again he starts talking about the n-word and that, mm, and that was uh, bad. I've yeah. never said the end. Well, you're an, you're an idiot. You have everybody had, mm -hmm. and you don't mean it as a racist. It, it you're you're saying it generally or whatever in the con in the context that it was set in back then. It's not like it is as it's evolved. And mm -hmm. Mark should have just said, "Yeah, we all have," and it would have been over. He would have floored F. Lee Bailey to sit down because all he was after was the whole thing was about race, Laura. It started being about race. And yeah. if you go back to the first news conference that Johnny Cochran had after he was subbed in for Shapiro, mm. one of the newscasters asked him, is this about race? Because we were coming off Rodney King. Yeah. And Johnny Cochran said, no, it's not about race at all. It's about an innocent man. Two weeks later, it was all about race. All like, about race. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So, well, let me, let me ask you just uh, quickly about the Bronco and is – it wasn't seized as as evidence, uh, to my knowledge, which is crazy. Why? That's the getaway car, so to speak. Why would you not seize that and and hold it as uh, as evidence? I, I'm, I that blows my mind. We <laughs> we had when Van Adder went over the uh, over the fence to look at the car, and he saw the blood in the car. Um, he really is thinking like, well, where's the blood from? Is Simpson hurt? You know, did somebody do in Simpson? So the the nexus between him going over the fence to the car and then the, from the car to the house has always been argued. Do we have probable cause enough to go from the car to the house? And again, you know, having the vials of blood and the bloody clothing and all that in hand and going and look at that car, the entrance is, well, you fools, you did this. And... <laughs> I don't know why the car wasn't taken. I would have taken the car, but again, that's a hundred years later and hindsight's 2020. And for me to say that, yeah. you know, I would have taken, I would have taken the house, I would have just yeah. take the whole house and booked it. I just, I don't see, I guess I don't see how one would not be able to secure probable cause when he is arrested and everything that he touched that night or the days after would not be considered um, part of that. And, and it would be difficult uh, to get an affidavit to, to seize that stuff. I find that really hard to believe. Part of me is I try not to be conspiratorial, but I always just think back, like, was he this big celebrity that maybe some of these cops really idolized? I, I don't know. It's, it's a thought that I've had. And additionally, just to wrap things up on OJ, what are your thoughts on the people? Because I, I remember when OJ died, I had some words to say. <laughs> and uh, I lost, I think I lost like, shockingly, maybe like 20 followers on Instagram or Twitter, or wherever. Uh, and one of the people uh, that unfollowed me was like, don't you know it was uh, it was his son 
And I this oh it's the, the son with um with the issues. I think it was Jason Simpson. He yeah. has um some cognitive issues, I believe. And and that OJ, he's like, OJ's a hero. He's he took the fall for his son. And I'm like, wait. And then he went on a crime spree in Vegas and like turned into this career criminal because he's such a hero. I'm so confused. Let me, let me tell you what, what and, and I know. I don't know him well. I, I've met him a couple of times, Simpson. Um, O.J. Simpson was becoming irrelevant the last five years of his life. Mm, Avis yeah. had dropped him, or Hertz rather. Um, he wasn't doing any commentary for football. He wasn't being contacted about anything regarding any sports. Yeah. And when you're that high up on the chain and you fall that far, you start becoming a different person. And to yeah. people who were interviewed, who said like Marcus Allen? Oh, I didn't notice a change. Well, he did. Yeah. And in the restaurant that night, OJ went off on Nicole in front of so many people, calling her a fucking bitch. You cunt! Yes. How dare you not? Yes. I'm sorry. Am I allowed yes. to say that? Yes. Sorry. Um, no. And stormed off because he wasn't invited to go to. I'm, I'm sorry. At the at the recital of Sydney, they were going to Mezzaluna for dinner. He wasn't invited. He mm. got just so pissed off about that. And screaming and yelling, that's not the Simpson from 25 years ago. I idolized that guy at SC. That's that's who I wanted to be. Yeah, and yeah. He fell from grace, Laura, and he he was uh, uh, he was he killed two innocent, butchered two innocent people. I agree. Yeah, I, agree. I mean it, it's too bad and it's sad, but you know what? That's part of life. Mm. And I'm sorry, you have to deal with it. And he couldn't deal with it. And there was a substance abuse problem, admittingly. Um, by Simpson. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know what? It, it, of his passing, I think it's like, okay, it's now over. And there will always be questions, there will always be arguments, but make no doubt that man killed two people and walked out of that courtroom a free man. Yeah, yeah right. Um, well, gosh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Leaving it, leaving it there, um, because no, I, I, I agree with everything you said. I do want to uh, move on to the next crime scene and this case is is unadjudicated technically the first trial ended in a mistrial but this is the alleged murder of officer john o'keefe out of canton massachusetts officer john o'keefe was uh with his friends for a night out drinking and his girlfriend karen reed as well when uh karen dropped him off at 34 fairview at a, a fellow Boston police officer, because John was with the um, the Boston Police Department, uh, Brian Albert. Brian Albert, he's recently retired, but uh, Brian Albert worked there. And it, it seems like when John was invited uh, to Brian's house, he really wanted to go. He looked up to Brian. Maybe he wanted to rub elbows and, and you know, just kind of get some FaceTime in. And I think his girlfriend, Karen, wasn't so sure. Like, are we invited? We don't really know them. So she drops him off, and according to the people in the house, he never went in the house. And uh, according to um, those people in the house, they also never saw him uh, when they were leaving the house. They never saw a body on the ground. And he was six foot one, I believe, or something like that. And it has been a huge point of cont contention, very divisive. So... Yeah, I mean, there there is a conspiracy that Karen Reed was framed because if you're not familiar with this case, Karen Reed has been charged with murder, second degree murder, that she, in a drunken rage, backed over her boyfriend, hit him, and then fled the scene. So I want to point out that, that Dawn really doesn't have any sort of uh, opinions, biases, or, or backstory with this case we're talking strictly crime scene here now this was january of 2022 in canton massachusetts so weather is a factor don and you uh you know you're in la weather <laughs> is not necessarily a factor as much but it proved to be uh pretty difficult to the police i i guess um for them to collect what they needed to collect with the snow coming down. It was a blizzard, essentially. So 
first and foremost, I, I do want to ask you just a general question. How, how does weather affect an investigation? Oh, it, it, again, we don't have snow here, thank God, or the city would lock up and, and God knows what would happen. But, you know, we have some pretty substantial rain sometimes. And I've been out numerous times in pouring rain. And it's very difficult. You're, you know, prime stuff is getting washed away. Blood's getting washed away. Um, uh, expended rounds and, and uh, are, are washed away as is any other kind of scientific evidence. So you try to secure that scene as best you can and you recover what you can. Now, again, I don't know how you operate in the snow. Um, I've read through some briefs um, regarding this case. Again, obviously, like in every other case, there are mistakes that I see you know, that made. How they hung, I have no idea. Because again, it's, it's a lot of circumstantial evidence in there. There is some scientific evidence in there. Mm -hmm. um, they, there, there's, there are statements which, again, I, I think they could have done a better job going through the statements and re-interviewing a couple of these witnesses after they did. They did it, first and foremost, all those three ladies are precipient witnesses to what happened at the house when they found the body later. And to leave them in their home, to talk mm -hmm. together about what was going on is probably the number one flaw of any crimes investigation is you separate the precipient witnesses. They didn't do that. They did not. Right. They, That's right. Yeah. And. And again, you're talking, I think Canton Police, I don't know how big that police department is, but it's not, you know, the Boston Police Department by no means. No. Um, when they found out, and I don't know when they found out he was a cop, but the shit changes, Laura, when it's yeah. a law enforcement guy. And, and it should, it should change immediately because now, you know, what was he involved in that caused his demise? And was a criminal? Was it domestic violence? You know, we don't know. But now we have a dead cop and it goes up to the next. Not not than everybody else, because in LAPD, every homicide is handled the same. Don't care whether it's Simpson or some gangster from South Central Los Angeles. Mm. It's the same. I don't know about them. However, it's a cop. And you're going to do everything you can to make sure if that cop was killed, yeah. you're going to solve it and you're not going to screw it up. Yeah. Uh, that said, um, they're putting things in, in plastic solo cups. You know, you don't have a, a bag or a baggie. I, I guess for me, it's like I if they're used to if they're used to that weather living in Massachusetts, most of them for their entire lives, I would think that you would be able to have someone that can bring you the proper materials. I mean, especially like we've discussed knowing that this is one of your own. And I think it's really important what you said. Witnesses should be interviewed separately, not really at their house. Uh, no one's saying that you're a suspect if you have to come down to the station per se. And you can agree with me, disagree with me. I just feel like in cases I've covered before, if there is a car accident and let's say it's just it's an obvious accident where the it's a single car the person has hit a tree but they are deceased this is a crime scene and anyone there is going to be treated as a witness to a crime scene now a lot of the time you can't bring you know a passerby who stopped down to the station i'm i'm sure however somebody that was attending a party uh and who was with the decedent up until you know their death i i feel like would have a bit more information possibly additionally if they were with the decedent's girlfriend who made certain statements that morning which have been questioned the uh did i hit him could i have hit him or i hit him so all of this is in question so for me the fact that they just did it in a living room the, the cops and they casually asked you know these witnesses questions i'm like ooh, i don't know if that if that was my family member, or my friend. I would and want. And right on with that, Laura. Um, sterility is, is so critical in, mm -hmm. in a homicide investigation. Is you need to separate again the precipient witnesses from the casual witnesses, and you get them into your station. You put them in interview rooms, and you interview them. Um, uh, his girlfriend was again allowed sitting with after she came back and screaming and yelling, oh my God, you know, I, I, I've seen him and where is he at? And mm -hmm. immediately she's got to be separated 
and, and law enforcement, the first patrol cops on scene are trained to do that. Get those witnesses, you know, get another unit, get her out of here, get the other three witnesses, get them out of there, don't let them talk, and we'll be back in a little bit. Now, the witnesses that were across the street, to see if they have ring camera, you don't need to bring them to the station. Okay, that could be, again, your canvas. Right, but right. First and foremost, that's where you start with those those three people. And yeah. We're it. Yep, I, I agree. And then, you know, everything after this just seemed to be a hot mess, if you will. I, I mean, and I think that I've spoken to certain guys in law enforcement who have said, you know, sometimes I have this bad habit. And this is somebody admitting it to me, you know, and I've tried to break it where, you know, I'm going to a scene and I already have the suspect in mind, even though I don't necessarily have proof, I don't necessarily know exactly what the deal is. He said, I, I, I feel like I need to to get that out of my head here. Like I need to get that. So I think what we learned in the first trial when lead detective Michael Proctor took the stand was that 16 hours into the death of a fellow police officer, he he did determine based on Karen Reed's, I guess I'll call it an alleged statement because it seems to be so conflicting, the I hit him versus did I hit him. He took that as she did it, you know, she's going down, she's going to pay. And I felt conflicted in a way because this was first manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, vehicular manslaughter, whatever. And then the charge was up to murder, which was such a reach. Um, and this charge was up to murder because they found voice messages or vo and text saying that she hated him and she was screaming at him well after he was deceased, uh, most likely, which didn't really make sense to me, I guess, unless you're Betty Broderick, right? Um, I just, it's it's strange. So hearing him on the stand just say these horrible things about the defendant, but not only that, it was like, yes, that was God awful, but it was more about my job is done here. I'm not talking to the witnesses because they're cops. And it's the house. I'm not going in there because oh, the, the the house belongs to a cop. So I was like, hmm, that's that just doesn't seem uh, like a thorough investigation, if you will. And and I don't know if Canton PD or, or the state police of Massachusetts has a a special squad that handles law enforcement uh, deaths or law enforcement involvement in criminality. We do at LAPD. Okay. They roll the DA people roll um, yeah. the attorney's office, which wasn't there, and and you can you can take each step of this investigation, at least for me. And and again, every investigation you can poke holes in. It's the totality of what you've done. I think there was an absolute rush to judgment, but I think he had the right to. You know, mm -hmm. there's another individual, and it, it I don't know if this was brought up in the trial that was driving the opposite way of where she was driving the black Lexus and saw her, right. Yes, and, there were. Yeah. I mean, listen, this case is God, Don, this case, we could go on for hours about who saw what. I mean, with certain things about the key cycle uh, of her actually backing into him has been utterly confusing for me because that same witness that saw her going that way also said her car was on the entire time. So then that key cycle confused me. So I just think that from from the start and and listen, for this next trial, I do feel like their uh, accident reconstructionist, the first guy, Trooper Paul, he was so horrible and it made the department look horrible that they have someone like this th that they deem as an expert who didn't have a physics degree. He didn't have any sort of a uh, degree. He he couldn't explain anything. His His answers were it just did. And it was just it was horrible. So I think that is just another misstep in, in the investigation that they didn't have the right people. So I think for the next trial, they're really going to have to step it up with their experts and actually spend money. Um, yeah, you know? I don't know so, if, they, if the state police, I know out here with the California Highway Patrol, they got a thing called a map team. Yeah. And, and those guys, they're, they're all educated. They're all degreed in reconstruction because that becomes critical. And going back to what you're talking about, I think this was overcharged. And here's the problem that some smaller areas, I think, they want to make sure that, hey, we charge this girl for, you know, blah, 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 blah. 
instead of giving the jury an out and saying, hey, we charged her with second degree murder, but you have to also include manslaughter, right? And yeah. if this chick would have been smart, she would have just said, oh, I, I've been, I'm on my ass. I think I hit him. Get out of the car. And the thing yeah. is, she would have been absolutely, but other than being intoxicated, she would have been charged with manslaughter, given probation, and on everybody went. But they they really didn't do anything to, to garnish that. And that's on the DA. But yeah. more so, Laura, is that detective, Pock Proctor, is handling the case, who's a lead guy. That's a critical component and a conduit of what's going to be charged and not charged, right? If you, you could have charged a guy with first degree murder, but if you don't give the jury an out, they're saying, oh, God damn, you know, this, this doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem here. Oh, manslaughtered. Okay. It's got, you know, all these elements of that. Okay. He fit those. They gave him no out. Right. And I bet you when they come in and they, they file again, they're going to have the lesser degree of manslaughter on there. So let them argue about manslaughter. Well, that, so that was, so that was, it was manslaughter, murder, and leaving the scene. Right. Uh, but, but it was confusing. Uh, and this is, this is like a whole other, a whole other thing where um, the jury slip at first was, didn't appear to be correct. Um, and, and then the defense said something and then the judge was like strong arming them and saying no. And then she changed her mind. And then jurors came out after saying that um, they were actually not hung on each charge. They were only hung on manslaughter. They actually said they agreed uh, not guilty to murder and leaving the scene. However, this is per um, jurors through the defense attorney. I don't have, yeah. like, I didn't speak to the jurors. This has not been, uh, like, I guess, as as hard, solid facts, if you will. So, yeah, I I just think personally that it's a huge waste of the state's resources to uh, try this woman, Karen Reed, for murder. I don't, I think if anything, yes, try her for manslaughter. If there is a possibility that she hit him with her car and it is proven in court, then I will accept that and believe it. But as of right mm -hmm. now, I don't find her to be a vicious murderer. Uh, Let me go back yeah. With the intent to injure, okay, she has to, it's, it's a specific crime manslaughter or, yeah. or, or murder. And if it's, and I don't know how their statutes read, but she has to have the specific intent to, to hit him, but she did, right? Mm -hmm. And again, I, I don't know why they overcharge things. LAP or, you know, LA attorneys do that a lot, uh, DAs, yeah. they'll, they'll overcharge, but they also give the jury an out. And I don't think this jury had an out. I, I think, you know, they, you know, again, the, the report should have been written a better way. They could have interviewed better. And the president, the, the crime scene, the reconstruction, I mean, it all was a, not shoddy, but it's like amateurish. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, it's not. That's it's what not happens. Great. Not yeah. great. Not great. But I bet she's yeah. probably guilty next time if they file on her. And I don't What's know if they, I bet they find her guilty of manslaughter the next time they file on her. Well, the next trial is supposed it's J in January as of right now, but they uh I both sides, the defense and the commonwealth are pushing it for uh April. Mm -hmm. So, they're both in agreement. I don't know. I feel like for the family of John O'Keefe, they would just want to get it over with now. Personally, I feel like yeah. if that was me, I'd want to get it over with. But yeah, I whatever they think will give them enough time. I just feel like it's a lot of money being used to convict this woman. And it does give you just the it gives you the feeling that things are going on in Massachusetts at the police department right now between a few other cases. Sandra Birchmore, you know, uh, Matthew Farwell, who was a, a Ma I believe, yes, Mass State police officer. He was recently arrested for uh, her murder and a slew of other charges. He groomed her since she was part of the Explorers program. That is a horrific, horrific case involving the Mass State Police. And also some of the same digital forensics experts looked at Matthew Farwell's phone as well as Karen Reed's phone and were on the stand. And with Farwell, they're like, nope, didn't find any text between them. Then the FBI got involved and they're like, oh bro, there was over 32,000 texts. So oh, yes. it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of crossover. And it's just, oh, gosh. And there was another rookie uh, MSP 
a guy that just passed away during training. Things are going down and they're not looking great. So my point was, I feel like the murder charge here and the fact that they're spending money on a special prosecutor for the second trial and probably much better experts means they they need a win in this community. And Karen Reed to them is their win based on what's happened. Like as in the whole uproar of of the free Karen Reed movement and and all of this stuff. I do I feel bad. It's been so much less about John O'Keefe, Officer John O'Keefe. And so, and that's what's what's tragic about this whole thing. But again, I also think that it's it's just gotten completely out of control. And I don't think she's a vicious murderer. I think if anything, prove to me she hit him. And I will say, okay, I do believe it was by accident because I don't think she was all murdery. Um, you know, while they're at the bar and she's rubbing I think his it's back. Too, murdery. Murdery. Like, did she got all murdery after she was rubbing his back at the bar? I, I just don't think so. And that's that's my opinion. But I if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. And I'd say that I'm wrong. But no, I think anyway. I think you're on to on to it. And again, she's not a callous murderer. I don't think she plotted to go no. kill him. Mm -hmm. um, they're breaking up. I guess she was pawing some other dude in the bar. And, no, uh, I mean, it was like a flirtation at, with actually an ATF agent who texted her that night. Because yeah. I guess she wasn't really paying attention to him, and her defense attorney blew that up into something more than it was. Yeah. That's his job, obviously, and it made for, uh, I guess, an interesting trial, right? Doesn't make, because, doesn't make her a killer. No, it does not, and and it just, it's it was all messy. I mean, that was gosh, I cannot believe, sitting through that trial again is going to be, That'll be uh, interesting. yeah, agree. So yeah, all I right. gotta, I want to throw this in too. And, and just a really quick, I had a, a triple yeah. murder that started an arson fire that killed three people. Mm. And we have three eyewitnesses. Um, one of the burned victims that survived all identified this guy. Um, 18 hours later, we catch this guy. He, his hands are singed from fire. He reeks of gasoline. From the moment I arrested him till the day that they sentenced him to death, he told me, you told, you know, I'm innocent. You said you'd find Bluebird. He's the guy that did this. I'm getting framed for this, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And like I tell everybody to this day is, listen, I'm just a gatherer of fact, mm -hmm. right? And I gather the right facts. If it points to you, it's you, Don. His name was Don. Yeah. And, you know, if, if this Bluebird guy, and I don't remember to say the guy's nickname, if he shows up, let me know. And I'll go interview him. I don't care. I get paid to solve these things. Yeah. Well, yeah. the day he was going up to San Quentin to the death row, this guy, Bluebird, was brought into Chino Prison, and I get a call from this guy, Donald, frantically telling me that the guy's there. So he ships off to go to San Quentin, and I went and interviewed this guy, and there was a polygraph key regarding a yellow lighter that we never released in the mm. press. This fool tells me, blah, 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 and blah, 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 and he goes, I took out this yellow lighter and threw it. I'm like, oh, my God, he's telling the truth. Right? Long story short, I walked Donald out of San Quentin death row, a free man, and they charged this guy with a second degree murder, but there's a lot of story to that. Oh, I got yeah. chills. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. So, wow. so when you know you're what? wrong, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is this is a, just a big open sponge and, and all this shit's got it. But if I take it to the DA and it points to you, God, I'm sorry. And I'm sure there's mistakes made, but. Right. Man, Ended up, by the way, those three witnesses were all paid by the suspect to testify and say what they did about him. And uh, the burned up victim, and I got this yeah. really quick. My burned up victim was living in Olive Branch, Mississippi. Okay. We go see this guy in Olive Branch, Mississippi. And Lauren, this guy was almost in the complete feudal position when he was burned. Up. The guy was like 90% of his body was on fire. That's we so walk sad. up to him and he's smoking a cigarette. And I'm thinking the last thing I would want to do Oops, sorry. anytime, anywhere is smoking. So anyway, yeah. like I said, things, you gather the facts and if it points to you, it's you. And if it's not, then, you know, hopefully somewhere down the line, you're freed. I mean, that is so sad. God, so chilling. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. Well, uh, we will wait. We okay. will. I, I'm trying to keep up with some of these pre-trial hearings yeah. with, with Reed and O'Keefe, yep. or, or I should say Reed pertaining yeah. to O'Keefe's death. But the last case I wanted to bring up, which you saw me uh, preemptively pull up a uh, a screen, I wanted to play this before 
we go into um, your thoughts, but, and I have this set to 1.25. If it ends up being too fast, I'll slow it down. But I want us all to watch this or listen if you're listening. This is the interrogation of Brendan Dassey. <laughs> Brendan Dassey uh, was accused of being a part of the murder and rape of Teresa Hallback with his uncle, Stephen Avery. And you may remember Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey as the subjects of Netflix's 2015 documentary, Making a Murderer. I am pretty shocked that Brendan Dassey is still in prison. I am very shocked, but I, I wanna pull this up, Don, and I wanna play a little part of it so we can all watch it together, if you will. Absolutely. Let's see it. I just have a seat, Brendan. Tell I just gotta stop off for a minute, and then we'll be ready. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> Soda, water. You sure? Or water, maybe. Okay. They do this on purpose, leave you in there, right? Yeah. yeah. This is the thinking period. And they're observing, I'm assuming, right? Okay. I'm just going to fast forward a little bit because he seems to be in here. Oh, wait, someone came in. I'm just going to shut this audio off, okay, because there's audio in the room here. Just so yeah. you know. Okay. Um, I just wanted to just go over this real quick again. Do you remember these rights, your Miranda rights that I read yeah. you? Um, you still want to talk to us? Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure of that. Brenda, I want you to, to relax, okay? Um, a little more comfortable here and stuff. And what we'd like to be, you had a couple of days since we last talked now, which was Monday, and you had a chance to reflect and breathe, I imagine. Just, and yeah, I'm, I'm, we, um, so you the last one, the only one? I got more. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I kind of call it, it just sense the briefing in a way, you know, just let you talk to us a little. And, um, and, and we've had also a chance for two days now to look at what you said and listen to the to dates a little and stuff like that. And, you know, we look at that and we say, well, you know, Brendan gave us, honestly gave us this information, this information, that information, maybe I'll call them dots or whatever. And some of the dots, when we look at it, say, well, I think we need some matching up here, just a little tightening up or something. We, we feel that, that maybe, I think Mark and I both feel that maybe there's some, some more that you could tell us um, that you may have held back for whatever reasons. And I want to assure you that Mark and I both are in your corner, we're on your side. And you did tell us mm -hmm. yourself that one of the reasons you hadn't come forward yet was because you were afraid, you were scared. And, and one of the reasons you were scared was that you would be implicated in this or people would say that you helped or did this. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that you might get arrested and stuff like that. Okay, and we understand that. One of the best ways to, to to prove to us or more importantly you know the courts and stuff is that you tell the whole truth don't leave anything out don't make anything up because you're trying to cover something up a little um and even if those statements are against your own interest you know what i mean that that makes you might it may, might make you look a little bad or make you look like you were more involved than you want to be uh, looked at um wait I just want to pause for one second to note to everybody, his mother apparently gave permission for him to be questioned without an adult present or a lawyer present. However, Brendan Dassey has cognitive issues. Uh, I'm going to speed it up just, just a bit, okay? Before you go and speed it up, Yep. Orn, look at his body movement, right? He hasn't changed that position from the moment that they sat him down no. until almost the end of the unit. He's not displaying anything that would make you think, okay, 
he's nervous, he's hiding shit. He's, he's he, right. he, um, that poor kid sat like this for, for a while. And they should have thought like, yep, they should have stopped right here and go like, dude's not even moving. When they had him yeah. isolated, he's the same position. His right hand was in his pocket. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yawned a couple times. Wow. That's anyway, a great yeah. point. He is not sitting there, someone who's like fidgety, like, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, his hands to his hair. That's so yeah. interesting. That's such a great point. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to yeah. speed this up just to get through. I just want to get through a few minutes of it because I want to hear Brendan talk. And I like the way that this uh, this investigator is is kind of teeing him yeah. up to be like, yeah, yeah, we're on your side. We're on oh, your yeah. side. Hard to do, but it's good from that bench point to say, hey, there's no doubt you're telling the truth because you've now given the whole story. You've been given points where it didn't look real good for you either. And I don't know if, I, if you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> And, and that's why we kind of came here to let you talk a little, maybe get some stuff off your mind or chest if you need to, and then to tell us the whole truth, to take us through this whole thing that happened on Monday, not leaving anything out, not adding anything in. Because Mark and I looked at, looked at the tapes, looked at the notes, and it's real obvious there's some places where some things were left out or maybe changed just a bit to, to maybe looking at yourself to protect yourself a little. Um, from what I'm seeing, even if I fill those in, I'm thinking you're all right, okay? You don't have to worry about things. Um, what were they for you? Um, and, I, and, and we know what Stephen did, and, and, and we know kind of what happened to you and what he did. We just need to hear the whole story from you. And as soon as we get that, we're comfortable with that. I think you're going to be a lot more comfortable with that. It's going to be a lot easier on you down the road uh, if this goes to trial and stuff like that. We need to know that because it's probably going to come out. Think of Stephen for a second. Stephen is already starting to say some things, and eventually he's going to potentially lay some crap on you and try and make it look like you are the bad person here. Um, and we don't want that. We want everything out front so we can say, yeah, we knew that, Stephen. He told us that. You, you, know, you get my drift. I, mean, I don't know, Mark has something, so I'm just going to give you an opportunity to talk to us now and, and kind of fill in those gaps for us. Honesty here, Brendan, is the thing that's going to help. Yeah. Okay, no matter what you did, we can work through that. Okay? We can't make any promises, but we'll yeah, stand here, let me pause No matter that. what, no you, matter did. what okay. you did, I like that. They're not doing a bad job of, of talking to him, but again, mm. he hasn't moved. They're, they're saying, you got to tell the truth, and hey, I, you know, I'm your friend. Same position he's in as he was when he came in the room. Yeah. He's blinking like he's not understanding half of what they're saying. Just no. by his body movement, then the other officer that's sitting next to him, mm. he's got to be looking at him going, you know, either we got to tune it up a little bit and get him to start doing something or something's wrong. Right, you know, right. I, I, This is, it's pretty mind blowing that they're just still talking and he's yeah. still just like hanging out, you know, not saying anything. Because you're being the good guy here. You're the one that's saying, you know what? Maybe I made some mistakes. But here's what I did. The other guy involved in this doesn't want to help himself. All he wants to do is blame everybody else. Okay? And by you talking with us, it's helping you. Okay? Because the honest person is the one saying, get a better deal out of everything. You know how that works. Mm -hmm. You know? Honesty is the only thing that'll set you free. Right? And we know, like Tom said, we know we reviewed those tapes. We know there's some things you left out. And we know there's some things that maybe weren't quite correct that you told us. Okay? We've done, we've been investigating this a long time. We pretty much know everything. That's why we're talking to you again today. We really need to be honest this time with everything, okay? Mm -hmm. If, in fact, you did some things which we believe some things may have happened that you didn't want to tell us about, it's okay. As long as you can, as long as you be honest with us, it's okay. If you lie about it, that's going to be problems, okay? Does that sound fair? Mm -hmm. All right. Should we just go through that whole day again on the 31st? Or how you want to well, do we can do that. I'd give him a chance to just talk to us. Again. Sure. If he wants to go through the whole day, if he wants to fill in the pieces, that's, that's up to Brendan right now. What would you rather do? Excuse me. When was Miranda those? read to this guy? Yeah, starting with that day. Well, that's right. How you actually came to know what happened and stuff? Because now we know you were in the garage and stuff apparently cleaning up and stuff. So tell us about that. Well, he was working on his car and like he did something wrong and then like he poked a hole in like something and then it started leaking. And then later on when, because I was helping him before, I went over there a little bit. So I'm going to pause and for a minute. Later on, he, me and help. I'm going to pause and I'm going to fast forward all the way to the end because I want to show you that this goes on for yeah. four hours okay this is a child okay this is a child i believe he's what at the time 15 16 yeah. however he uh he does have de developmental delays his brain is is that of an elementary school child so let me just fast forward to the very fourth hour where he's starting to lose it going in the house and getting a few items and about you going out there with us and her and um, 
pointing out those areas that we wanted you to point out. Is that all right? Do you know where those shoes are that you were wearing that day? It's the red shoes. I think they're in the closet. Okay, what about the jacket? In the closet. All right, we'll have your mom come in for a few minutes, okay? All right. Now, watch him here, okay? He is in distress at this point. Fast forwarding to his mom. Did he make you do it? Kind of would have all helped. That's what I would have done. They cry. She's hugging him. Uh, now everyone's talking. Yeah, it's a lot of this. Um, and then by the end of this, I'm going to just get this off. But basically, by the end of this, it's very clear that investigators essentially say, just admit to all of this and uh, you can go watch WWF or whatever the hell it is that you want to get home to. And essentially, that's what he did. It, you know what? And again, they're double teaming him. They're in soft clothes, which I'm sorry, but you know they should have been in suits and ties, like like professional detectives should be. And and more importantly, is they're not giving him a chance to talk. They're just boom, 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 staccato, and you know, questions. Let him talk. Get an idea of where he's at in your uh, interview with him. The other thing, there's no Miranda. And they meet, I don't know if it was outside the room, but in there when they came in, if they're recording this and they know that they are, Miranda is this kid. You have to, in, in California, the moment you arrest a, a juvenile, he's got to be rid of his Miranda right, you know, if you're detaining him. Mm. So the way that kid sat for that first hour or so, just the same exact way, and the way that they're just hitting him left and right, they, they just, they kind of screwed it up themselves in there. And the other thing is, mom should have been in that old interview or telling mom, hey, we're looking at this guy for a murder. If yeah. you want to get, again, an attorney, you can, but this is where, where we're at with this. And yeah, it, and it, I, it's a travesty of justice with that guy. Well, Don, I wonder, I wonder about like when, if this is you, how are you able to determine if a kid is, you know, if his IQ is well below what it should be and if he has these cognitive disabilities? When do you find that out? And and at what point do you maybe stand down and say, oh, gosh, this might not be the best confession here because how, can we use it? With his aunt, the way that he was sitting and the way that he looks and his expressions to me, it's some, you know, he's not right. And I would have, again, talked to the mother. When I came, you know, when they were had him isolated? Yeah. Same thing, right hands in the yeah. pocket not acting any way shape or form as a as a suspect or, or culpable mm -hmm. in anything um presumably mom was outside and i would have said does he have any kind of problems you take a medication right that's, is he right. is he is he slow you know it, because we need to know that to interview him properly and yeah there was no way that that kid was responding to all their questions and yeah you can do that you can make that kid confess to something he has no idea about. You can do that to a normal human being. After 18 hours of being interviewed and hammered and hammered and hammered, okay, yeah, I did it. Now, can I go to the bathroom? Can I? Oh, God. Yeah. Leave? Well, you know, I just wonder, Don, and I have, it's been a long time since I really dove into this case um, piece by piece, detail by detail. But from what I recall, I don't know if he was necessarily diagnosed as being slower it, from what i remember and where he lived it, it might have just been like this is just him and and this is just and his parents don't really see 
They don't know anything else, right? right. They don't know. Right. It's not like, you know, um, so that's where I, I, I guess I, I get a little tripped up. If I'm looking at him and I'm interviewing him, I would have stopped every now and then. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Tell me, tell me what you think I'm saying you, so that right. I know that you're with me in this just to get a gauge a reading on him. Right. And, you know, I've interviewed ju juveniles that were involved in murders a, a zillion times. And that isn't the same type of guy that I've ever interviewed. You know, they're all sitting back like this. You know, their body yeah. movements so are like, I, I don't want to be here. He just sat there like a lump, right? Yeah. Well, you made a good point. So the body language does seem to, I mean, it starts off pretty much at the beginning where he's leaning back. He's not even moving. He's very relaxed. And then at the end, you've got four hours of this interrogation with these officers not liking what they're hearing. And, and you know, I, I obviously didn't play it and go through it little by little, but it's like, by the end of that, this boy is in utter distress. He is stressed out. He wants his mom. I mean, I think that right there is when his youthfulness and and uh, small childlike qualities really start to show. And that, to me, I'm not law enforcement, but that should have been a, a red flag. I feel like, like, no, look, you're right on with that. This kid you're is right. breaking down. Yeah. Oh. Um, and something else I want to point out is because he has these disabilities and when he was being tried in court, uh, reporters had said he just appeared stoic the whole time. Therese the Hallback's family had said he did not appear sorry at, at all. And this is what I feel like because he has these disabilities and it could be that he's on the spectrum. I'm not a doctor, but a lot of these guys, they don't have the ability to feel empathy if he did do it. And clearly it seems like he had some kind of part in it, I, you know, whatever. But it's like, he's never going to get paroled because the parole board wants you to be sorry. They want you to feel empathy. This, this kid doesn't know what that is. He's not, he's not all there. So that's why I just see so many things wrong with his conviction. I'm not saying he shouldn't be convicted if he did this. Yeah, but lock him up, but get him help and, and you know, make him uh, just just get the right doctors in place, get get the right diagnosis in place. See, the other thing, and you're absolutely right with that, in my opinion, is he shouldn't be there. And if, you, if again, put him in a state hospital and get him work or help, um, you know, maybe he was a part of it. But, and what part According he played. According to the, the state, yeah, he was. And what part he played in it. Mm. But that Cretan uncle of his, Avery, you know, he could have absolutely exonerated um, Daisy in, in as part of being culpable for the murder. And and again, I just think that's a horrible, horrible interrogation. And uh, you know, that kid should not be in jail. Not there. Not in prison with other inmates that are hard ass criminals. Yeah, so he's just not. Yeah, he's not. Uh, I, I don't know. He he just. Oh, like I, I can't again, I, I hate to like make these hard opinions on on it only because, again, I have not uh, just gone super deep in a while. But, yeah, it, it would seem like he he needs some mental treatment. But but I mean, I'll have to go back and do a dive. But this was specifically on uh, police interrogations and yeah, and and whatnot. Um, but. But yeah, Don, I feel like this was so much fun, uh, regardless really? of the the tough subject matter. It's it was lovely to speak with you, and I feel like I learned a lot as well. Oh man, it, it, this has been an honor for me too. I know that uh, I've heard about your podcast, and and not being the podcasting guy that I should be, I, I do appreciate you looking at all these and maybe bringing to light to people what is going on. And, and like I said when we first started, is there's mistakes made at every crime scene, and you learn for the next time. Um, these guys aren't aren't infallible, but yeah. the the important thing is is you know is it a mistake of the heart or the mistake of the mind, and yeah. and that's what guides you. So you know these, these guys try the best they can, but they really need to realize that you got to really be careful. You've got to tread lightly, and that what the, the end game is, you're going to get a conviction if this guy is truly guilty or a person of the guy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so this is it's great talking about it, and I and I love that you're doing this and bringing awareness and everything else. Blah 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 blah. So thank, thank you, you for having no, me. No, uh, 
please. Thank you. And and where can people find you uh, on social media if they want to follow you? Let me see. <laughs> the relic that I am, I, I don't have, I have an Instagram, but I don't know how to tell you to get to it that was was made for me. But I do have a website. Yes, I now. have your website, which is in the episode notes, actually. Okay. So um, I do, I do have that. Um, and Don's website is actually, it's very, very simple. It's just Don Tabak, uh, net. So that's D O N T A B A K dot net. I also have a link to the illusion magic lounge yeah, where cool. your show. Yeah. Your show is actually happening November 24th. I believe I said this weekend, yeah, it's actually the that. next weekend. So yeah, yeah invite everybody come out. We're going to have a great time. Um, talk about some of the Simpson cases, a couple of other ones that uh, were very unique. And at the end, we're going to solve a murder. And, yeah, uh, I love that. Gosh, I wish I lived in the area. I'm flying out. out. I'll get you a free I, ticket. I would, gosh, I, I would fly love that. To, to get in. But have <gasps> it, it's at seven o'clock on, on that Sunday um, before Thanksgiving weekend. Mm. So come out and play with us. Sounds great. Well, maybe we can do one in New York City. Maybe there'll be a, a chance to. Listen, you tell me when, and I'll come out there. Yeah, that would be great. Well, um, Don, this was awesome, and I and also I believe the Instagram you were thinking of is at Crime Scene Live. Um, yeah, so that is the Instagram that you you speak of that you're not. That's it. Yes, thank you. I'm gonna write that down. So if you yeah. ask me again, I'll know. <laughs> It's all good. Well, I hope you'll come back and join me again to discuss uh, another case. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, Have a great bye, day. Don. Happy Thanksgiving for you. You too. Because of that nine dash line, and had proved that look, if you're not into geopolitics, you won't notice it. I mean, hello.